So good morning. I'm Gabriel Poesia. I'll be presenting here the work I did as a master's student, where Fernando was my advisor, and also with the help of Breno and Fabricio. So our work in one picture would be this. We receive as an input an arbitrary program written without any concern about the architecture or architectures that might be running that program. And given a description of the different processors we have, we might want to map some parts of the program to run on the different processors. So we might want to, for example, say that this, some function could be off offloaded to a, GPU or to a GPU processor if it's highly parallel and, and profitable to do that. We might want to send some parts to a cloud server. And of course, most parts will probably remain on the good old CPU as well. And we want to do that automatically. And why would we want to do that? Of course, hand-optimized code is usually faster than this kind of procedure. However, it also needs a knowledgeable person to optimize it for the given architecture. That takes time and effort, and it's also not, so, not portable. If I want to change the architecture, or if I want to run my program on different architectures, my optimizations might not work as well on all of them. I might, might need to re-optimize the program. So if you could just have a compiler procedure that does some kind of optimization taking the architecture into account, that would help the average programmer make use of heterogeneous architectures, which are ubiquitous today. We all have smartphones with CPU, GPU, sometimes multiple CPUs. So if you want to do that, there are several factors we need to take into account. For example, if I have a CPU, GPU system without unified memory, and I want to run a computation on the, the GPU, the first step is to send the data to the GPU memory. So the first question would be, where is that data? Is it on the GPU already, or is it on the CPU on the main memory? And given that I know where it is, what is the data that it needs to be copied? If I just have a pointer to an array, what is the size of that array? It's not, also not trivial to, to, to see that just by looking at the program sometimes. How costly it is to transfer the data. It might, that might kill the performance benefit of just running the computation on, on the GPU. And of course, how fast is that computation there? How, how well does it map to the architecture of the GPU? And to complicate things a little bit, this all can change in different parts of the program for a same fun function. Right? If I, we'll see more of that in the future. So here's a simple concrete program to guide our discussion. It's a very simple program in which function main receives as input four matrices, four square matrices. Then it performs the computation on the bottom. It adds two of them. Then it multiplies that to the third matrix, and then adds the fourth matrix to the overall result. And what we should we do about the matrix multiplication? Should we just run the code on the CPU, or should we transform it into a GPU kernel and run it on the GPU? It turns out that matrix multiplication maps really well to the way a GPU works, and we quickly start getting performance benefits by running it on the GPU, even though we have to pay the cost of sending the data there. And what about matrix addition? Matrix addition is also, also happens to be embarrassingly parallel. So should we transform it in, into a GPU kernel? And it turns out that because of the cost of, uh, the, of, of sending the data to the GPU, just that kills the performance benefit of running a parallel matrix addition on the GPU. However, what happens if the data, if the matrices we want to add are the results of other computations which are already on the GPU? Then it does make sense to, make, to perform the matrix addition there, since we don't have to pay the cost of transferring data anymore. So to take all of that into account, we devised a, a data structure we call the extended call graph. And it's basically a, a very intuitive extension of the traditional call graph. We have, on the left, we have the call graph of the program we have just seen. And what we do is to clone functions to indicate that they might run on different processors. So for example, matrix sum and matrix multiplication, we have we had one version in the original program. In this extended call graph, we pre represent them as two nodes, one for running the computation on the CPU and one for the GPU. And so, now that we have this graph, we need to put back the call edges in them so that the graph kind of makes sense. So that, for example, function main ca uh, calls once some of the versions of matrix sum 
And also some of the versions of sum and multiply, sum and multiply may call a different version of matrix somewhere in matrix multiply. So we are now ready to slightly formalize our problem. We're going to that direction. Of course, the details are, are in the paper. So we assume we have uh, cost models both for the nodes of this extended call graph and for its edges. The cost for the nodes would indicate the cost of running a function on a given processor, and the cost for edges, the cost of transferring data that is needed between function calls. And now, our objective function becomes to minimize the total weight of this extended call graph, to put edges that minimize its total weight, so the weight given the, the cost models. The weight is not just the sum of the edges. It, we define it recursively, kind of considers all the calling context in the program. Uh, and it turns out that with a few simplifying assumptions, we can solve this problem optimally using dynamic programming. And it's quite fast. Uh, the, the, this scheduling algorithm runs in all of v plus z, which would be the functions plus the number of calls in the program, times p squared, where p is the number of processors in the architecture. So if we have a CPU GPU architecture, for example, P would be two. So it's usually a small constant times the size of the program. So what do we mean more precisely when we say cost models? So a cost model for nodes would be a function that maps a pair function processor to a real number. And it might, it might have some free parameters. We'll explain what that means. So here is an algorithm that can serve as a cost model for a CPU. It's a very simple model. It's just a, more of an example of a model. So basically what this algorithm is doing is it receives a function as its parameter, its only parameter, and then it iterates over all instructions in that function, and it calculates the depth of nesting of the loops that contain that instruction, and it just uh, computes loop iteration, which is a, one of the three parameters we talked about, to the power of depth, and adds that to a total cost. So if a function is contained in one loop, we just add loop iterations to the cost. If it's contained in a doubly nested loop, we add loop iteration squared, and so on. And if we want to, to, do a, to create a cost model for a GPU, we would need to consider a few more, few more factors, such as the cost of running a kernel, of launching a kernel, the number of GPU cores, uh, whether the loops are divergent or not, which are some factors that affect performance in the GPU. And the cost models for edges, they simply tell us the cost of performing a function call from one processor to, the, to another. And we actually use the very simple model. If the processors are equal, then basically the cost is zero. We don't need to copy any memory. And if, if we're calling, making calls across different processors, then we just multiply the number of array parameters times a function, uh, a constant k. We're just saying that transferring arrays and matrices is expensive, and transferring scalars is negligible, basically, for this context. So by looking at these cost models, you might ask, isn't this too simple to work? I mean, it, it doesn't really reflect how a computer works by any means. But we don't actually need that. We don't, need, we, we don't actually need cost models for this purpose that predict running time or correlate with running times in any way. We only need models that kind of guide our dynamic programming algorithm to make good choices about which, are, which processor should run each function. So as long as it does that, as long, as long as these numbers are useful for that purpose, we're good. And of course, we talked about some free, model, free parameters that we left in the cost models. For example, the loop iterations was one of them. In the GPU cost model, we left a parallelism factor, which would kind of map to the number of GPU cores. And instead of looking at the harder specifications and trying to come up with reasonable values for those parameters, we employ an automatic tuning procedure. So basically, we get a training set of benchmarks uh, and we run simulate the annealing more or less in the following way. We start with random values for the parameters and then for each iteration, we run a, a fixed number of iterations. We compile, we optimize all those those programs in the training set using the values we have, we currently have for the parameters. Then we run those those programs in the training set. We compare the running times against the original ver or original sequential version, and then simulated learning works so that 
even though we might make our programs worse, we might prob probabilistically take those values so that we do not get stuck into local optima. But of course, the goal is to make programs better in, in the long run. And of course, when we talk about training set and test set here, we, we also borrow more ideas of experimentation from the machine learning methodology, kind of. So it's not a fixed set. We, we use k fault cross validation. We vary those sets. So let's talk about which results we got with these techniques. We implemented this using Clang and LLVM 3.7 in a tool we call Etino. And these implement the scheduling, scheduling algorithm. So after we decide which computations should run in each processor, we pass that to another compiler called DOMCC, which inserts OpenACC pragmas into these programs so that, so that to implement the scheduling we decided on. So it basically inserts like ACC kernels, ACCP copy to copy data, things like that. And we used three benchmark suits, the computer language benchmarks game, the classical one, Polybench, which contains tensile and linear algebra computations, and data mining, which contains slightly larger implementations of some data mining algorithms. And we tried three different architectures. Uh, two of them are basically different versions of an NVIDIA GPU and a, an Intel CPU. And one of them is a mobile architecture used by some Samsung phones, Exynos 5. So it has an ARM processor. And we have several experiments. Some of them are not shown here in the presentation for brevity. The first one is regarding the, this calibration phase, this auto-tuning phase. So what this figure shows is that what uh, over the iterations, when we run simulated learning, we eventually happen to make the training set benchmarks faster. But when that happens, the, the benchmarks in the test set, which are benchmarks our algorithm is not aware of, they also get better, they also get faster. So those are, are the circles, and the triangles are the training sets. So when we make the training set better, we make, we found a general model that also optimized the test set. The, of course, this is across different architectures and different setups. Here is just one of them, but the, the other results were quite similar. So after that, after we got this best cost model we could find with simulated annealing, how well did it perform? So here we compare our best cost model for you, for, from the last phase against DOMCC in its unguided mode. And what DOMCC does is to basically offload all the computations it can from the program through the GPU. So it, when, it, when it finds a parallel for loop, it basically creates a GPU kernel for running that. And what, it, what we found is that we maintain all of the main speedups that DOMCC accomplishes by doing this. But in a lot of cases, DOMCC also, also slowed, slows down programs by quite a lot. So for example, one of the programs in the computer language benchmark game, Fankuch, it's a terrible idea to send it to the GPU because you get a 550 times slowdown. And by using our cost model and, and all of this procedure, we managed to avoid that. Basically, what Etinu does is to say it doesn't make sense to, to compute this on the GPU, even though you can do that. And if you remember our cost models, they totally disregard input size, especially because that's not something you can do at compile time. You cannot consider it statically. So this experiment, try, uh, it, it tries to observe how do our programs behave when we vary the input size. And what we found on the left on, on the, of the vertical line are some of the programs that Etino got slowdowns when optimizing. But we see that when we grow their input size, things actually got better. So some of them turned into speedups, and the slowdowns tend to shrink. On the other hand, on the right side, these are some programs that DOMCC chose to, to offload to the GPU, and Atino decided not to do so. And some of the slowdowns got worse, some of them remained constant, and some of them shrank. But in the end, they still remained significant, especially because the huge input is the largest input we could run on that machine. So this basically means if the huge input incurred a slowdown, it basically means that on that machine, we could not uh, grow this. The, the input anymore to eventually get a speed up. And also, 
because we depend on DOS in C to automatically transform the programs, there are a lot of programs which it cannot transform automatically. But even in those cases, we can still use Atmos cost model in scheduling algorithms. Oops. We can use still use the, the algorithm to tell us which computations we should send to the GPU, and then we can go through the program and perform the, those changes manually. So this is what the data mining data uh, benchmark suits served for. It has three slightly larger programs, and DOCC is not able to transform these programs automatically. However, if we go to the program and manually do what Atenos tells us to do, we got good speed ups from ranging from 5 to 75 times. Of course, this comes from using the GPU, but if you do it naively, as we saw, if you just do it arbitrarily, you can even lose those slowdowns. So, as a, a summary, we got positive results on automatically mapping computations uh, to heterogeneous architectures. This is an online version of the tool. You can just go to the page, paste some code there, and see what it does. The major draw drawback of our algorithm at this point is that it does not use processor concurrently. So it might choose to run a function on the CPU and on the GPU, or on the GPU, but it won't run a program, run like at the same time, use the GPU and the CPU. That's a major thing. And you could integrate that with techniques for detecting tasks in the program, kind of transforming it automatically in that direction. It remains as future work. And even though we only experimented with the CPU-GPU architecture, you could theoretically use the algorithm in more complex scenarios in which you have more kinds of processors. So if anyone wants to go into that direction, you already have a baseline at least. So thank you, that was it. If you have any questions.